Madam President, I rise today to voice concern about the current state of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In 1949, more than 60 years ago, the United States joined with 11 other nations to create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, in order to ensure the mutual security of the member nations. From the beginning, the United States has served as NATO's backbone and provided a major share of the cost in manpower and resources. We have consistently answered the call of our NATO allies when they needed us, even when there was no clear United States interest involved. For example, in 1993, the United States military answered the call to participate in the NATO air action to enforce a UN ban on all unauthorized military flights over Bosnia-Herzegovina. After the Dayton Peace Accords in 1995, the United States stationed over 10,000 personnel in support of peacekeeping missions in Bosnia. For the following nine years, we continued to retain a large number of forces there. In 1999, the United States again stepped up and provided a major share of the military resources for operations in Kosovo. At that time, I argued that we were assuming too many commitments in areas of the world where our own interests were vague. When President Clinton announced that he intended to send 4,000 U.S. troops for peacekeeping in Kosovo, I said, if we think the United States has the responsibility to go into all these civil conflicts, we are going to dissipate our resources and it is going to place a heavy burden on our taxpayers. Today, after years of involvement with NATO-led operations in the Balkans, our forces are still a major component of the NATO-Kosovo force and we are still contributing approximately 800 troops to that effort. In fact, of the 22 nations now in NATO contributing troops in Kosovo, the United States military makes up approximately 13% of the total force. As far as cost is concerned, the United States taxpayer is still footing a very large bill for our presence in Kosovo. In fiscal year 2010, the President asked for $252 million to pay for operations in Kosovo. In FY 2011, it was $312 million. Now, as part of the fiscal year 2012 Overseas Contingency Operations Transfer Fund, the President is asking for $254 million. With this example in mind, I am now deeply concerned that we appear to be in the same position again, this time with NATO in Libya. On March 31st, NATO assumed command and control of Operation Unified Protector and was thereafter responsible for enforcing the no-fly zone over Libya. With this transfer of authority and responsibility from the United States to NATO, there was also an implicit understanding that all NATO member states would be expected to dedicate the necessary resources to adequately enforce UN resolutions 1970 and 1973. However, almost immediately after taking command, NATO requested a 48-hour extension of support from American fighter aircraft. This request for continued support from American air assets seemed to be at odds with the President's statement that coalition forces would be able to keep up the pressure on Gaddafi's forces. And so, once again, our nation is called upon to provide the bulk of the resources and funding for another NATO mission that is not in the vital security interests of the United States. Indeed, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates stated on April 21st at a DOD press conference that while it is not a vital interest for us, our allies considered it is a vital interest. And just as they have helped us in Afghanistan, we thought it important, the President thought it was important, to help them in Libya. We are now on track to spend more than $800 million of U.S. taxpayer money this fiscal year on operations involving Libya. 
I ask with significant concern, how are these operations going to be paid for? Where is DOD planning to get the extra almost billion dollars to spend on this operation? What programs will need to be cut to fund this third operation in which we are now involved? Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya. Will the President be submitting a supplemental appropriations bill on Libya? Now, with the example of Libya in our minds, let us be clear as to exactly what our allies are contributing to the efforts in Afghanistan. As part of the International Security Assistance Force, which is the command in charge of operations in Afghanistan, the United States is contributing 70 percent of the total force, with 46 nations contributing the remaining 30 percent. And so, as we review the landscape of American military commitments overseas, let me emphasize, with U.S. forces deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, we should not also be participating in open-ended conflict in Libya, where we have no clear, vital national security interest. Moreover, I believe our NATO allies who do have a vital interest in Libya should be willing to pay, play a lead role in terms of funding as well as military resources. The fact is, NATO and the Arab League should be shouldering the brunt of the military and financial burdens associated with Operation Unified Protector, just as we are doing in Afghanistan and have been doing in Iraq. If we had all members of NATO contributing proportionately to the mission in Libya and also had the Arab League providing comparable financial and military assistance, the overwhelming commitment of our own U.S. forces would be lessened to a manageable degree. Madam President, I am frustrated that our NATO allies continue to contribute such a small amount of resources for operations that are in the vital interest of many NATO member states. In Libya, I believe that if the United States military were to stop providing to our allies our unique military capabilities, NATO operations for both the no-fly zone as well as the civilian protection mission would be seriously degraded and could terminate. How have we arrived at this unfor unfortunate state of affairs? Why is it that NATO nations are willing, unable, to effectively operate against a weak and isolated nation like Libya without significant military contributions from the United States? One reason we are in this position is because many NATO members are not contributing enough of their gross domestic product to defense. Instead, many NATO members simply look to the United States and the American taxpayer to pay for any gaps in defense capabilities. And because many NATO nations do not invest strategically in their military capabilities, they are heavily dependent on the United States to pay for advanced equipment such as intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance platforms to support their NATO operations. I agree with Secretary Gates' recent assessment that NATO is turning into a two-tiered alliance in which very few members, except for the United States, take on the hard power combat assignments. Instead, the majority of NATO partners limit themselves to soft power work, such as delivering humanitarian aid. Indeed, of the 28 NATO members, only five, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Greece, and Albania, exceed the agreed-upon ratio of 2 percent of gross domestic product to be spent on defense. Two decades after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the U.S. share of NATO defense spending has now risen astoundingly to more than 75 percent. Secretary Gates put all of our efforts under NATO uh, alliance operations together 75 percent. We are all aware that the United States is facing very hard and real, serious fiscal constraints. 
Hence, it is clear that we can no longer continue to pay for the vast majority of NATO operations that are not in the vital security interests of our nation. It is time for the United States to ask our allies to step up and keep the agreement they made when they became part of NATO, or for the United States to consider reducing our spending level that we now provide to NATO, and also move to redeploy a large portion of our military presence in Europe back to the United States. I have spoken on the floor many times about my concerns for maintaining such a large military presence in Europe. And I will continue to fight for spending cuts to a largely unnecessary and expensive United States military presence on the European continent. It was decided in the last administration to cut back to two brigade combat teams in Europe, in Germany. We have now had the two be expanded to four. The other two are now in limbo. So there are now four brigade combat teams in Europe, and two were supposed to move back to the United States, and the military construction to house at least one of those has been done at a cost of over 400 million taxpayer dollars. So we have the capability to bring home troops. Taxpayers have spent $400 million in pursuit of that. The barracks sit empty, and we still have four brigade combat teams in Europe, in Germany. Unfortunately, here is the message that we are sending to our European allies by that military presence and by our operations in support of NATO that American taxpayers are willing and able to shoulder the burden for their defense, and that there are apparently no consequences if the Europeans fail to do their fair share. Madam President, we need to change that message. We need to give our nation's current financial difficulties a priority. Our message should be that NATO has been a valuable alliance, a valuable alliance for 60 years. And it can be in the future with an effort to share the burden. That means truly sharing. The U.S. to lead when our capabilities are essential. We do have vast capabilities. When they are essential, we have shown we will always be there. But others can lead where they have the capability to do so. And they need to do it with personnel and with the pay force. It is increasingly a threat to our security that the complacency of our allies are so great that we are shouldering more and more of the burden, even if it is not in the direct interest of the United States. The American taxpayer can no longer afford to write endless checks for NATO operations. It is time for our allies to shoulder their responsibilities and reduce their dependence on United States military forces. Madam President, we want to keep our military strength. We have the greatest military in the world. There is no doubt about that. But to keep our military strong, we cannot over-deploy our forces. We have had, and I have talked to people who have been to Afghanistan six times, on rotations six times. Most of our uh, people who have gone to Afghanistan have gone more than once, and that is following all of the times they have been into Iraq as well. We must keep our military strong by not overburdening them because our allies are not supplying the troops that they agreed to provide when they became members of NATO. For us to keep the strength that we have for the big operations where we have the unique capabilities, we must be smart about allocating and sharing the responsibilities. We can take the biggest share, but not 75% of the share, 
and remain strong, especially with the financial constraints that we have today. We are in the midst of negotiating how we can lower our deficits so that we don't hit that $14 trillion debt ceiling without a plan for bringing down the deficit so we will never have to lift that debt ceiling again. So it is in everyone's interest for our allies to step up to the plate. They made agreements. It used to be a 3% gross domestic product commitment that was required for NATO. Now we're talking 2% and only five countries. Only five countries meet that test. That is not a sustainable alliance. If we drag down our strongest member, it will not be in the interest of anyone if something big happens that needs an immediate and robust response. So I appreciate that Secretary Gates, in his final uh, three weeks, one month in office, has talked very straight to our NATO allies. And I hope that they are listening and I hope they are prepared to act. Yes, they have financial constraints too. We understand that. But it is time that the sharing be shared. It is time that we have a real alliance in which we remain strong so that we have the strength to respond in the big emergencies where we are called. But being dragged down by smaller emergencies that can be uh, handled by others, whether it is Kosovo or uh, even Iraq or certainly Libya, uh, and certainly people are concerned about the situation in Syria and Yemen, we can let others handle and be in the lead in those areas so that when the big things such as Afghanistan will continue to be, can be handled by the United States with our unique capabilities and our commitment. Our fighters are the best in the world. Our equipment is the best in the world. Our training is the best in the world. We need to maintain that strength with an alliance that has a burden sharing where we are the lead, but we are not in such a lead that we are dragging down the capabilities for the future. So, Madam President, uh, I applaud Sen Secretary Gates for uh, starting this dialogue uh, in earnest. We've talked about it for a long time, for years actually. We have talked to our NATO allies about stepping up to the plate. Even in the good financial times, that didn't happen, uh, but for a few. And I will say that the Great Britain has always been there, and we have had other strong alliances, Australia, not in NATO, but certainly a strong ally. Canada, strong ally. Um, but it is time for us to reassess our contributions in NATO to preserve our strength so that we are there for the big ones, which is in all of our interests. Thank you, Madam President, and I suggest the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Conkin.